Think of a great street in your city. Older buildings with shops and restaurants on the ground level, and apartments and offices above. Lots of people walking around, meeting with friends, and bumping into strangers. A great street is a destination in its own right. Yet in most cities, streets like these have become outdated. Yo. You'll need a car to get to where you're going. Once you pick up on it, you can realize how a city's design can really change your life and how it influences everything from a city's vitality to housing costs, even crime. But how did we get to a place where so many American city streets are bad? To figure out how American cities got this way, you need to go back to the 1920s and 30s, when the modernist planning establishment began tightening zoning regimes that neatly separated commercial, industrial, and residential buildings. The stated purpose of zoning laws was to prevent nuisances and pollution where people lived, but also to guide developers to build and buyers to live in the single family home, widely viewed by city planners as incubators of the ideal American family. To do this, city governments carved out wide swaths of city land and confined them to single family homes, typically restricting residency to one family. And this presented some major problems. So when you zone something for single family homes as opposed to multifamily homes, it has the effect of making housing units more expensive. That's economist Sandy Ikeda. And he says that one of the main effects of single family zoning was to lower the availability of low income housing. I mean, very simply, it's, it's more complicated than this, but if you have a lot which can accommodate one big house, let's say for 4,000 square feet, if you could divide that up into four smaller units of 1,000 square feet each, the individual units could be sold or rented out at, at a lower price. Take a look at this zoning map of San Francisco with the single family zoning colored in red. The city is dominated by single family zoned housing. And that's a major reason why San Francisco's housing costs are the highest in the United States. Cities across the country have begun to build out by heavily regulating the ability to build up, creating scarcity at attractive city centers and bidding up the price closer to city downtowns. And so the uh, supply has not kept up with this increasing demand. You want people to live in dwellings that have a minimum size, but the consequence of that is people who can't afford that minimum size won't be able to live in those dwellings. And so what are they going to do? Is there a logical stopping point to minimum housing sizes? You know, why don't you make the minimum house size 2,000 square feet? Then we'd all live in palaces or 4,000 square feet. Let's, let's make everybody in New York City live in a single family home. You know, that'll solve the problem. Single-family zoning laws of the 20s and 30s went a long way to realize the vision of cities held by modernist planners. But they weren't enough, and by the 1950s and 60s, cities weren't just blocking traditional urban neighborhoods from being built. Armed with new federal backing, cities gained license to rezone and condemn neighborhoods as blight, often wiping out entire neighborhoods for minor building design infractions, like not having wide enough lawns separating each dwelling. This had the added and often deliberate effect of forcing out poorer minority residents from the city, who tended to live in denser multifamily homes that were disliked by most modernist planners. The explicit reason was to promote safety. Later on, many of these zoning codes were used to segregate populations, either explicitly by race or by uh, cultural uh, backgrounds. In place of these neighborhoods, the modernists favored further single-family home building, but they also favored long, wide streets and narrow sidewalks with the goal of reshaping American cities around the automobile. They would erect massive civic centers and plazas, sometimes with the primary goal of achieving architectural aesthetic, often forgetting the people they were architecting for. And this is when the modernist planners drew a challenger. A uh, real rebel that everyone points to, and, and rightly so, is Jane Jacobs. Uncredentialed and mostly self-trained, Jane Jacobs was a renegade to the status quo in city planning. Who, in 1961, published her great book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, the opening sentence of which is, this is an attack on urban planning. According to Jacobs, the modernist planners failed to see the city at street level and saw cities only from their maps and dioramas. She started going to some of these places inspired by modernist uh, urban planning and realized they're not being used by the people the way that the designers had intended them. In fact, many of them were not being used at all. The response she got was something like, well, you know, people are too dumb to know how to use this. Or she thought, this is crazy. Wait, they should be uh, figuring out how people actually use space and then designing those spaces in a way that will accommodate those uses. 
Jacobs hated the modernist wide streets and narrow sidewalks, and she condemned their zoning codes that separated residents from the bustle of restaurants and businesses. She warned that these features would isolate people from one another and made cities unwalkable, making streets less safe and weakening the social capital that springs from unplanned interactions of pedestrians. She wrote, this isn't the rebuilding of cities. This is the sacking of cities. Jacobs focused on how many of the modernist plans had become more important than the people they were drawn for. In a famous essay, she said that, there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it, and it is to them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. This people-centric perspective to urban design led Jacobs to emphasize the importance of allowing mixed-use zoning, where businesses and residential buildings intermingle and allow residents to walk to businesses. Jacobs noticed that the more people walking on a street, the more interesting a street becomes, attracting what she called eyes on the street, making residents feel safe from potential crime. And instead of long, endless streets, Jacobs emphasized the importance of short blocks, which encouraged pedestrians to make frequent turns and take alternating routes, giving businesses off the beaten path a fighting chance by not favoring any one path to begin with. And with businesses scattered throughout neighborhoods, the city suddenly opens up to pedestrians. If you understand how a city works or an economy works, it's a result of a lot of people following their own plans. It generates outcomes that nobody can predict. This unpredictability of people should make us wary of imposing intricate plans on them. So what can city designers do to avoid making the mistakes of the past? I would say, be aware of the consequences. Try to take into account the costs of what you're doing. The true city where experimentation goes on, where you have face-to-face -face contact, where you have social capital, cannot be completely planned. So you have to be modest. You can't make people use something in exactly the way that you want it to. The idea of neatly designing our cities is tempting, but learning to appreciate the emergent and complex order of the people who live in them might help us better shape them for the future.